questions for you tonight. Number one, welcome to the first program ever in the new museum. The museum itself will open on March 21st. There will be a series of previews and premieres, a members opening the night before, Friday night, the 20th of March, and on the first day of spring, the, the March 21st, we'll open to the general public. Uh, and we're really looking forward to it. There's some wonderful exhibitions in line. The first will be a kind of a uh, greatest hits of the textile museum. It will be titled uh, 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 Unraveling Identity, Our Textiles, Our Stories, which will be a thematic view of textiles in all sorts of different ways that people can understand the theme of identity and intended to welcome uh, a new audience to the museum, students and young professionals and people in the Foggy Bottom area. And, and it should be a, it'll be a wonderful show with a lot more interactivity than people are used to. Touch screens and videos and these kinds of things to make it, uh, to make the interpretation much, much more uh, relevant and exciting. There will also be two exhibitions with the Albert Small Washingtoniana collection. First on the founding of Washington, D.C., and the second on Washington's transformation during the Civil War. So there'll be three exhibitions opening on the 21st, and it's going it's to be very exciting. We are going to break in pieces of the museum a little bit early. So this building, this room will begin to be, well, it's beginning tonight to be used for programming that will ramp up a little bit. We are continuing to program in the S Street location for the Rug Saturday mornings and for the uh, Ask the Curator, Ask the Conservator events and other type events that traditional textile uh, 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 programs are scheduled for that, uh, that site and so we'll continue to offer things until, certainly until we open the new building or until a buyer appears for the building itself. And if anyone's interested, we can get you in touch with a wonderful property on S Street. The, uh, the second welcome, I owe you two welcomes, the second one is for welcome to the first in a series of conversations with important contemporary artists today, uh, Voices of American Design. Uh, we intend to have a series of these every month or so as we lead up to the new, uh, the opening of the new museum and if, uh, if we can we might even have a few more afterwards. Uh, I'd like to thank a an anonymous donor who's made this all possible, doesn't want to be recognized, but I certainly want to know that we all appreciate the generosity that makes this, uh, this, this event possible uh, tonight and, and in the future. This wonderful support that's really made uh, uh, the affiliation of the Textile Museum and George Washington University uh, possible. We're really excited about the, uh, uh, the opportunities in this new building. Uh, we've calculated the number of exhibition of, of programs that we intend to have here relative to the old textile museum and in the first year of operation we anticipate four times the number of programs. Evening programs, drop and lunch programs, uh, 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 programs by students and faculty of the university. So by joining the university, the textile museum is, is, is opening the doors to all sorts of scholarly and intellectual and cultural partnerships that this room is really a nucleus for uh, to be complemented by the galleries and the displays all, all around us and we hope that this be a, a that this is a, a really vital place for uh, for conversations uh, and cultural affairs in the broadest possible sense as well as, as textile arts themselves. Uh, with that said we'll be around afterwards certainly and I'd love to answer anyone's questions about the uh, future plans for the textile museum but you've really come tonight to hear a special speaker. So, uh, to do the honors of introducing our speaker, I'd like to introduce our Curator of Education, Tom Gaynor. Thank you, Tom. Um, with us tonight to talk about weaving beauty, social responsibility, and environmental concerns is acclaimed textile designer, Stephanie Hodegaard. Hodegaard has dedicated her career to utilizing natural, sustainable materials and to work done by hand employing a large number of people with a fair wage who otherwise might not have been employed. Um, after founding her company in 1987, Stephanie Autogard has produced and imported collections of uniquely designed carpets that have revolutionized the U.S. market. Prior to founding her company, Autogard worked as a buyer at Dayton Hudson, owned her own business in the field, textile arts field, 
followed by 12 years abroad, first serving in the, as in the Peace Corps, and for then the World Bank, the United Nations, and the government of Nepal, Jamaica, and the South Pacific Islands, as a marketing consultant for export from cottage and small-scale industry. In the mid-1980s, when she traveled to Nepal on assignment for the World Bank, she worked as a consultant to the emerging carpet industry being developed by Tibetans. After helping to stabilize the Tibetan wool market and developing relationships with reliable suppliers, she formed her own company later in New York to import her own specially produced carpet designs to the States. Dedicated to social responsibility in all her work, Audegard is a founding board member of Goodweed, a carpet industry foundation which maintains only the, the only recognized certification program to ensure that carpets are made free of child labor. We are delighted she was able to come down from New York to speak to us tonight. Please help me welcome Stephanie Audegard. Thank you, Mr. Why anybody would want to buy that? 
And so I was buying things for very little money, but I just started to buy, and then I said, could you make me another one? I'll come back and get it. So from that I learned that if I paid for it, and if I came, if I said I would come back, and if I came back and I bought whatever it was that I asked to be made, that it would be made. And another thing very important when you're working with people like this, you can't make false promises and just say, make me some more of these, and then never come back and buy them, or come back and say, well, that's not what I ordered. So it's, it's a tough, it's a really tough business to get into and to understand and to want to have the staying power to do it. And there should really be, what I learned from my own business experiences, there should be a, some sort of a development um, coming from the government side that would help these people maintain their crafts and learn to continue to produce like that because any entrepreneur like myself who has to delve in and invest in this, you invest in a lot of mistakes, but it's, it's very important in order to make the, the work go on. So these are some baskets. Later I went to Jamaica and this was after the Peace Corps. I was asked to join the UN as a marketing expert in this particular field. So I started some assignments in the, um, in the South Pacific. I went to many different countries in the South Pacific and looked at what they were making and tried to help them develop small industries around their own homegrown products, whether it be craft or you know, whatever it, it was. So this work became sustainable and, and successful. And the first word that comes to mind in what I do is the most important thing is the human sustainability. Because when you give someone work, it sustains their whole life and their family really forever. And I really, in my idealistic years in the Peace Corps, I really came to believe that I could save the world by making people work at what was their tradition so that they could have not only pride in what they did, but they could make the money that they needed to live. And I still believe that today. So um, you know where, how, how I feel about what's going on out there. <laughs> so it, I still think that this is what we need to do is we need to, we need to start to help people create jobs and everywhere I've seen that, I've seen sustainability. So um, this is in Jamaica and in Jamaica it was a different challenge. They had a lot of uh, sort of an, a design elite so in, rather than working with the craft workers directly, I worked with designers in Jamaica and we together developed about 300 products and opened a whole series of stores that were airport shops and in hotels and they were called Things Jamaican. And if you've ever been to Kingston, there's a project there called Things Jamaican and Devon House, which we restored and, and put the shops around the back. So not only is the project in Fiji, which turned into a huge craft emporium called the Fiji Craft Emporium, is still there in Suva, Fiji, but Things Jamaican is still in Kingston, Kingston, Jamaica. And so I'm, I'm happy to say that these projects are sustainable and this has been going on for 35 years. So after Jamaica, I was asked to go to Nepal. The World Bank asked me to go and troubleshoot on a project that was already started, which was called the Export uh, Service Center in the Trade Promotion Council. And I really didn't know anything about what was going on there. I had to look in a map to find it. This was back in 1986. And I found it and I thought, saw that it was close to India and I'd heard of that. So <laughs> I thought, you know, I really want to go to India and, and this would be a way to do it. And so um, I spent about three months after I started working for the World Bank, working in the US market and finding out who the players were and who imported carpets, and what were these beautiful things called oriental carpets. So I learned a great deal, and um, I learned a little bit about the people who controlled the industry here. And then I went over to Nepal, and I started to work with the problems that existed with that particular type of carpet, which had never been imported in the United States before. Nobody had ever developed it for the U.S. market. And it was only sold to the German market. And the Germans are very, very much attached to Nepal and very much attached to handmade carpets. And still today, they import the most hand-knotted carpets of any country in the world. And you see, it's much smaller than we are. 
but they have a different kind of um, view of design there. They have wood floors, they don't have wall-to-wall -wall carpeting, they don't even talk about that. And generally speaking, everybody puts oriental carpets on the floor, and the carpet is like an art. You just buy it because you like it as a piece of art, not necessarily that it matches your drapes and your cushions and your sofas, or it's just a little background music to the whole thing. So it was, but a completely different aesthetic from my own, and the quality of the carpet was very thick and nubby. And I didn't particularly like it, but there were a lot of other things I had to do there. And one was to straighten out the raw wool issue, which was going on. And as I was working for the World Bank, um, many, um, many of the Germans would call me and say that the raw wool supply had gone down and the prices were going up. And I was constantly dealing with the problems of the raw wool trade. And it was, at that time, it was all barter trade with China. It was if the Nepalese would trade something with, the, with Tibet um, in order to get the wool, salt, cement, different things that came from India through Nepal. So it was all barter trade. There was no cash money ever passed through. And at that time, the Chinese weren't even taking hard currency. So it had to be traded. So this went on for literally generations. And the wool comes from Tibet. And this is a picture taken in Tibet of the sheep that we get our wool from. They graze at very high altitudes, 14,000 feet. And this wool becomes very, very strong and lanolin rich. And I think it's probably the best wool in the world. And uh, I have a very uh, strong relationship to this wool and a lot of, uh, a lot of important things are going on with, with wool in the world. And I think, um, you know, we're looking at a population here of, of an animal that is not going to be with us very much longer because the areas where they graze and they eat off of the land, those areas are being deforested. And um, I've heard things said that, you know, in certain areas of China that they believe that the sheep are eating all the, the landscape. And so, you know, let's get rid of the sheep when, you know, we know that it's a whole different story in reality. So I think that there are problems with the with the wool growing in, in Nepal and certainly in Afghanistan. I think that they, they don't have very much wool anymore and Iran is running out of wool. So I can't imagine that this industry can last very much longer because the, the wool, this wool supply is going down. The, the supply of the good wool. Of course, in places like New Zealand and Australia, they're growing sheep for wool that can be woven into clothes and, and carpets. So these sheep are grazing in, in Tibet, um, which as you know is part of China. And I was in Tibet, the last time was in about 2006, and I was going on a road, we were going, it was in uh, the Amdo, it used to be called Amdo, Amdo it's called Xinning Province now, and it's the province where the Dalai Lama was born. And I was driving on a road to look at this lake with some people, and I saw this herd of sheep being sheared, and it was the first time that I'd ever seen sheep being sheared. And I've been talking about it because I've been making rugs for 27 years. So I finally got to see it, and it was one of the nicest days of my life. Um, you can see all these sheep, and they're all waiting with their coats, and they're, and they're uh, making a lot of noise, so it's just uproarious, and then they get um, they take them and they, they sort of fling them down holding on to their four legs and shear each one probably takes about 30 seconds and nothing gets cut and then they're naked and they run back and they're so happy to go back and they show everybody else that it's okay, you can do it too. <laughs> and this happens every year and it's, it was just absolutely delightful and the, the nomads who were doing it, they, um, they move around, they have their herds of yaks and sheep and they move from place to place, and then they set up their camps, and now, of course, they, they use motorcycles instead of horses, but, um, but they're moving around and they have their little houses that are in different places that they move to and from every year. And they, um, they offered us some fresh yak yogurt, so we were sitting there just in, in this beautiful day, beautiful fall day, well, it was, it was summer, but it seemed like fall and eating this fresh yak yogurt and, and watching this, this process. 
and they bundle up the, the, the wool just like that, and that's how the wool arrives in Kathmandu. And it's taken from, from these areas, it's sold through the traders to the, um, the people who then bring it across the border into Nepal. Now just to return to a moment to the trade of this whole thing. So when I was there, it was all done on barter trade. And this was done and controlled by a very old family, a mixture of a Nepalese-Tibetan family, which I call Katsura over there. And the main guy was a guy named Shamakapu, which means white cap. He always had this white cap, the Nepali-style cap. And I used to meet him, and I had to do a lot of uh, espionage to find out about this whole thing. But I had my Tibetans and I had different people that were feeding me information and I came to find out how this all operated. So I made a recommendation to the government that they put the, through the World Bank, because the World Bank mission was trying to give Nepal a $60 million uh, adjustment loan that they were asking for and there were a lot of negotiating points and maybe you remember that Kathmandu was a crossroads for gold and money and hashish and heroin and so many drugs in the old days. So putting the wool on open general license, which means that it can be bought with hard currency by the people who actually export the carpets and earn hard currency from Nepal, was kind of a throwaway negotiating point. And as a result of that, about, two, about a year after I left Nepal, this went into effect. So suddenly the wool could be purchased with hard currency and no longer was a barter trade item. And that is what allowed the Nepal carpet, the Tibetan Nepali carpet, to explode in the U.S. market. That and the fact that I had developed a new concept of design, which was modern, and also I introduced the um, 100 knot per square inch carpet to this market, which was much finer and much more to the American taste because the German carpet was very thick, only about 30 knots to the square inch, so it was very thick and plush and nubby, and it just wasn't the taste of the market. And I, I didn't really realize all of this, but it was not my taste. So I developed a carpet that I thought was something that I would like, and actually never dreamed of going into the carpet business, but I was doing it for myself, looking at old carpets and saying, Gee, if I take out that border and I put in this element and I remove that and I put this element from another place and I made carpet designs and in colors that I thought were beautiful and I thought, well, if I think it's beautiful, someone else might think it's beautiful. So uh, I ended up with a small collection that I had made and um, I never planned to start a business like that. I planned to, um, to bring them to New York and then sell them through another big uh, design resource like Star Carpet or something, but of course, when I showed them to those people, they thought that I was crazy, you know, absolutely crazy that the modern carpet wouldn't sell, and especially hand knotted, and so expensive, and, you know, Persian carpets have millions of colors and borders and borders and borders, <laughs> and that this kind of borderless carpet with a horizontal pattern and, you know, with two colors would probably not sell. That was in 1987. So this is the, the wool, and um, this is just a nice little aside story. Um, every year in Nepal, about this time, there's a holiday which is called Dasai, and it's a holiday of, it's a Hindu holiday, and Nepal is a Hindu, but Hindu mixed with Buddhist culture, and everybody gets along fine, so um, there's no conflict here. Some of it is very crossed over, and the, the, um, the two religions are mixed. But um, at this holiday, Desai, the Hindus uh, sacrifice a lot of animals, sheep, goats, and they bring these animals from Tibet and buy them and then sacrifice them and um, ceremoniously and privately and, and they eat the meat, you know, it doesn't go to waste, but they use the blood to um, purify things like engines and planes and they put blood all over everything, cars, everything to make things safe, it's a sacrifice, and then eat it. And um, my driver did it to my car once. I didn't know why I bought this goat and why it was living in my garage for a month, but of course I fell in love with it. And then one day they all marched with their knives and said, today's the day, and they cut that goat's head off and put the blood all over my car and decorated it. 
and my car was safe after that. So um, anyway, it was a holiday. I had to, you know, learn to get away from the ball during that week. So and a lot of the Tibetans do too. But the reason that I have this this little sheet here is because the Tibetans, because they're not of the mind to kill anything. They don't want to kill anything. They would buy the sheep to save their lives, and then they would turn into pets. So this was a pet that we had for many years at one of my uh, weaving centers. And this is Kathmandu. So when I went to work for the World Bank, I lived here for a year. And I now go back there at least twice a year. Um, to this day, I, in, the, in the beginning of my business, I had to go quite regularly because we were operating with a telex machine for communication. I don't know if anybody here even remembers that. Tom remembers it. <laughs> but I'm sure that some of, um, some of the lovely ladies from Goodweave who are in the back have never heard of a telex machine. <laughs> But our lives have been changed dramatically by having the tools that we have. So you can really be in the carpet business without ever visiting the path. Uh, so this is Kathmandu. As you can see, the mountains are all around. It's very close to Tibet. It's only about a four or five hour drive to the border. And that wool comes out of those mountains and it, and it comes by yaks, porters, trucks, um, straight into Kathmandu where we process it. And um, this is, um, you know, once again to reiterate that I really started my business not because I wanted to do a business, but because of the environmental and social commitment that I had, which is, you know, this to this day my um, still my my big concern. So the wool is um, has a very uh, long staple. It it's about that long, so it. It's, it's just great to be able to use this wool because it's full of lanolin and it's with the long staple, we can hand spin everything. So in my production, we hand card and we hand spin everything. So this is a demonstration of the long staple. So you can feel, if you just kind of rub it between your fingers, you'll feel the lanolin in the wool. It comes out in your fingers, and you can also pull it apart and see how long it is. So with this long staple, the first step is carding, which is combing the wool, which opens the fibers of the wool. Wool is a fiber that is like a, um, I hate to be a textile expert because I'm sure there's so many of you that know so much more than I do in the audience. But wool is it's like a pine cone, and it, it, the, it, when it's wet, it all mats together at the top, and when it comes off the sheep, it's very matted. So it needs to be carded to open up this fiber. Yeah. This is a one, card, one carder for some reason. The second carder didn't get put in the box. Otherwise, I would show you how to card. But um, you have to put the wool in and go like this. It's combed and it's opened up. It's, it's quite hard. You have to do it about seven times. So we, um, in the best years of, of my business, we had 10,000 people carding and spinning. And we usually do this in marginalized area. For example, right now, the people that we employ carding and spinning, mainly carding, are these, these prisoners who used to be in prison and now they don't have anywhere to go. They came out of prison, so they live in the forest in a very remote area, and we found out about them. And what we found out is that they were cutting down all the trees to get money and selling it for firewood. So my supplier, who's just a genius um, Tibetan, Tibetan man, went and talked with the forest ranger and said, you know, if you will stop your people from cutting down all these trees and put them to work carding, you can make X number of dollars a year, or X rupees a year. And so the forest ranger said, well, that's a lot more money than we're making cutting down all these trees, which is deforesting the place. So um, we're now using that group. Before that, we used people in the south of Nepal who were Nepalese origin, that they were actually, the Bhutanese decided to send all of the t uh, Nepalese origin, all the people that had Nepalese origin had to leave Bhutan at a certain point in time, so Bhutan could be pure 
not, not Nepalese. So the Nepalese had to live in refugee camps in the south of Nepal. So we heard about them, and they became our spinners and carters for a long time. And that was uh, where we got all of our wool processed. But then the United States gave visas to all those Nepalese refugees who were sitting in those refugee camps. And now they're all um, in nail salons all over the place. <laughs> I don't know if you've noticed, but suddenly all the nail salons were not just Chinese and Koreans, but suddenly they were Nepalese too. And, and actually, you know, really nice, you know, people to, to work with if you need to get your nails done. And you can find one. So, um, the one I go to is actually called Buddha. So, it's the Buddha nail salon, all Nepalese. Um, so that's a carter. And then, after carding, it gets hand spun. So, this is some yarn that has been hand spun on this very spinner. And this is the traditional uh, spinner that we use in a small, you know, something flat and you spin it like this. And that was traditionally how it was done in Tibet and people like this method because it doesn't break. It, it can just be, go with you. They were nomadic people as you probably know and so they took all their tools with them and moved from place to place and spun their wool and made the blankets and the rugs. Um, the carpet started as a nomadic uh, carpet that was used for sometimes prayer and sometimes just to keep the wind out. It's a very cold place or a door carpet or a window carpet or just a sleeping mat. Um, and there were some that were made in like tiger skins that the, um, the lamas would prey on because the um, tiger represents ego in the Buddhist culture and so they would sit on the ego, press down the ego, and um, so the tiger skins, they made beautiful stylized tiger skins. I don't know if you've ever seen a book of them, but the, the designs are amazing. They're so modern looking, and there's a book um, about from the Mimi Lipton collection, which is just really, really beautiful if you have a chance to take a look at it. So this is um, a, a lady who's carving. And she's actually the mother of my supplier, Amala. She's now in her late 70s, going strong. She does about 500 prostrations every morning. And she mostly prays, prays for our business. <laughs> anyway, she's spinning there with the drop spindle. And this is the other kind of spinning machine we use, which is, and we basically employ a lot of young men in this, in this industry, young couples, young men and he's spinning um, on a spinning wheel. These are some of the dye stuffs we use, and um, I wanted to pass around this indigo dye, and you can just open it and you can see the indigo powder. We, um, the, in the cubes are on the top. Underneath are some rhubarb sticks. I also have rhubarb. You're welcome to look at the vegetable dyes afterwards if you like, and the indigo is going around. But the indigo is processed by hand. It's pounded, and then uh, as you know, indigo is the most of all, fast of all dyes. And indigo, right now, people are really liking indigo. All of a sudden, it's come up, and all the indigo uh, design products and carpets seem to be selling very well. Um, this is madder root, which turns into a red color. And this is the traditional way of dyeing in a copper pot, which doesn't always allow for a dye lot to remain consistent, so we later have gotten into a different kind of a, a rather than the pot, this goes down into the dye and comes up, and this way we can do very large dye lots all in one. And we have the only smoke-free boiler in Kathmandu, and we also have a water filtration plant, so we've tried to uh, introduce a lot of, of uh, environmental uh, um, saving measures into our production. These are some of the vegetable dye yarns. Dyeing, there's walnut and indigo with rhubarb and madder root and rhubarb and indigo again. Um, this is yarn storage. And this is a picture that was taken in my studio in New York. We make all the designs and uh, we send the designs basically black line drawings over to Nepal and then they transfer them onto graphs and we have a color system, we have over a thousand colors and all the colors have numbers so 
we can draw them and then they can transfer them to the graph and we just need to put the numbers in. But for our customers who buy our carpets, we very often have to give them samples of the colors so they can take them and match them to their pillows and, and their uh, fabrics. And um, also, by doing this, we can show them how it will look in the finished rug if they most people like to custom color or custom size the carpet. And this is one of my artists drawing a design. And this is an artist doing a gouache rendering of, of a, a design, which is called um, e cut flower. And um, I find that the best way to show someone what a carpet looks like is with a beautiful gouache rendering. So um, you can see those out in the lobby. There are some on display. And they're very beautiful. Obviously, they're time consuming and costly to make. And now everybody uses computer renderings, which I really dislike because the colors don't match. And it just so, you know, demeans the carpet, in my opinion. But, you know, it took me years to get around to doing it. And of course, we do it now because otherwise I would be out of business. <laughs> so, because everybody wants everything fast and they want to see what it's going to look like. You know, they can't imagine it. So, it makes everybody into a carpet designer. Um, this is the crew in Nepal transferring it to a graph, and every um, square on the graph represents a knot in the carpet. And this is the knotting technique. We use a senna loop, which is a, uh, a knot tied around the rod, and then at the end of the row, uh, it's cut open, and people sit side by side, weaving. So let's say a 9 by 12, you'll have four four people sitting side by side. And um, weavers very often dress like the carpets that they're working on, which I think is really interesting. Paint their nails, the colors of the carpets, so they sort of, um, they, they do that. And this carpet is called the Vratna, and this is an antique, um, the Vratna jewelry that, that I, that's actually an antique, but um, it always has the same configuration of stones, and all those stones mean something and help your body, you know, when you wear such stones, and um, so I translated that into a carpet. This was the drawing, and as I said, we put the color numbers in, and then they transfer it to a graph, and this is the carpet. And then uh, this is a picture of the carpet on the floor, and he's holding us the Dalai Lama giving his Light of Truth Award here in Washington, D.C. a few years ago. Um, these always become much more valuable after the Dalai Lama has used it. <laughs> so the carpet gets sold and people take that away with them. And he's in New York right now and we just, we just gave him this carpet in another size to use in another presentation. Um, this, is, this is a design inspiration that I took from uh, a, a, Brazilian, a church in Brazil that I saw and turned it into this carpet, and it's, um, it's very, you know, fanciful, and um, it has traditional elements from the altar, but in a carpet, it, it becomes very modern. Um, this is a, taken from an ecot, and uh, this, this design, I won a design award of the year from interior design last year that was voted on on the network, so this is that carpet, and um, I, it's all knotted, but it looks like a um, like a tie dye. And this is um, the finishing after the carpet comes off the loom. It goes down onto the ground, and everybody's sort of sitting on the back of it, poking the knots through. And it's a very happy, uh, lovely time because the carpet is finished. Everybody's going to get paid, and the carpet's going to be shipped. And I always love this moment because there it really. It's so primitive the way it is, this very expensive carpet, and it's going into a very beautiful home somewhere made by these people, and this is the cross-cultural connection which, which we make when we buy an, a handmade article of any kind. And people walk into my showroom every day and say, you know, I walk in here and I get this sense of peace. And it's because the soul in the carpet it's really got a, a spirit about it because of the number of hands that have gone into it and the number of hours that have gone into making a hand out of carpet. It's, it's enormous. And um, I think in reality, people just 
don't understand how really cheap they are, considering what has gone on. Um, this is another process, hand scissoring the top of it when it comes off, off the loom after we've done the previous step. And then some designs are, are scissored to separate the colors and separate the definition of the design. I do scissoring on some and, and not on others. And there's another process after this, which is a washing of the whole carpet, and then it goes through a calibrated shearing machine. I do that in Switzerland or in Germany, and that um, really opens up that wool fiber, which, as I told you earlier, it's like a pine cone. And in order for the sheen to appear of the wool and the carpet, it needs to be tip sheared. And that refreshes an oriental carpet, too. So most uh, carpet uh, renovators or restorers will do that tip shearing after they wash the carpet to, um, to refresh it. Um, this is a loom in India. I have another collection that I'm doing in India now. And the weaving is quite different there. And also the knotting te technique is different. We don't use a rod in India. We just cut each knot which is called a Persian um, knot, or a senna knot, and Paul, the looping mechanism is called a senna loop. And of course, all the Persians tell everybody that our carpets, that we take shortcuts by having the rod, because we don't have to cut each knot, so they're less valuable. That's one of the rumors they started, in addition to one that says that children are needed to weave carpets because their hands are tiny and they can tie better knots. So these are myths that you probably have heard. And here's the, the, the knot cutting uh, knife. And this is the carpet. This is, yeah, this is raw silk. And then I'd like to talk about wood weave for a moment. I don't know how many of you are aware that Kailash Santiarti, who just won the Nobel Peace Prize with Malala, um, a few weeks ago it was announced, and I think all of us at Good Weave were just woke up that morning and heard that and probably started crying like I did. We couldn't believe it, because Kailash has worked with this for 40 years, trying to bring child labor to, to the light and, and raiding factories and getting the children out, rescuing them. First he finds their parents, and then he brings the parents along, and they have to do a raid in the middle of the night. It's very, very dangerous. And the kids run and hide because they're so scared. They only know their weaving master and know what, how, what it is like being a slave. And so he's been risking his life for 40 years to rescue these children in many different sectors, but mainly in the carpets. And he was the original founder of Good Week. So you can imagine how we felt when he got the, the Nobel Peace Prize because all these years that we've been trying to bring this problem to the light and to get the carpet importers to join Good Weave and participate in a very small percentage of the cost of the carpet into our foundation in order to have inspectors go and inspect our looms for, for children. And if, if they're found, then we ask the, their parents in the village if they want to have their child educated in our system or they want their children back in the village. We will pay for their education there. But through Good Weave, we pay for the children's education up through the 10th standard. And this has been going on since 1995. I've been involved with this. And we now have kids that have graduated and are going to college. They're fluent in English. Many of them have jobs and are out in the working world. So we found that in some of these kids are or orphans. They don't have any parents because they were left with during the Maoist revolution and their parents are all dead and you know so they were put into the factories to raise havoc during the Maoist revolution. So there's a lot of reasons why they got into the factory, not because their parents wanted them to go out and work, although sometimes parents are misled and do send their children out. But um, many of these children are go all the way through their lives in their schools. And so um, that's what we've been doing with Good Weave. And at the end, if there's enough time, I'm going to show you a little two, three minute video that's sort of a cartoon about, that really explains very succinctly how, um, how child labor works. And um, it's a real factor. Most of the carpets that are sold in this country are made by, ch by children. And that's why they're so cheap, but they're, 
definitely not as cheap as they should be since the labor is free because there's a certain part of the supply chain that is never paid and that's the child who's weaving the carpet. So um, when I started my business, I started it from the standpoint that we don't use child labor and that we're paying fair wages and so I, and then I, I pretty much set the standard, the price standard for this hundred knot carpet in a modern design and everybody else followed suit. But instead of keeping the standard high, they went to buy cheaper carpets that they don't have to question the supply chain. They don't want to question the supply chain. So they buy the cheaper carpets, but they still sell them at the same price because on the surface, they look very much like, like mine or like other uh, people that are subscribing or supporting Goodweek. So it's a, it's a really big, big, huge problem. It's really a scourge of the hand knotted carpet industry and there's no reason why they can't, why they can't be paired, made by adults. There's plenty of adult labor that needs to be employed. And if we could, right now, Goodweave has just started a weaver training factory in Nepal so that adults could, more adults could learn how to weave so that we can really have a really legitimate um, alternative to child labor. But you know, there are just people that just are greedy and that's just what they do. So. Um, that is the good, the good weave label, the uh, blank space there has a unique number. So every carpet that I sell has this label and there's a unique number. And that's my assurance that my rooms were inspected, no child labor was used. So it can go all the way back through the system. You can trace this number through good weave. And um, I can sleep at night knowing that there aren't any children on my rooms. This is posted on all the factories in Nepal because it is against the law, but it's impossible for the government to uh, monitor this, these industries, in, in particularly India, Nepal, and Pakistan. It's a serious problem. This is Nepal, and it, you can see it's quite different from Tibet. And these are some of the kids in the Good Leaf School. And we have, they go to, um, after they go through our rehab center, because when they come off the looms, they've never been to school, they've never had a childhood before. So they have to learn quickly how to be a child. So they stay in our hostels for as long as they need to, usually about three or four months, and they get up early, and they have their prayers and their calisthenics, and then they have their classes, a very accelerated education. The kids are smart because they've survived this long. So they're smart and they learn fast and they're dying to get out of whatever situation they were in. So they really, um, they really excel once they get their mood up after um, having gotten out of servitude. So they stay in our rehab center and then they go into formal school schools that we have arrangements with throughout Nepal where, where they take our students. Some are, we have scholarships, um, but they go out into the, into the school system. And this is um, just some children, the cute little pictures. Um, felt, um, I started to work with a group of men in India making felt by hand. Uh, it was a very old family tradition. And uh, I heard about them and I just wanted some little packaging made for something. And, and then I started to make felt rugs. And um, this one was in the Cooper Hewitt felt exhibition a couple of years ago, and uh, along with another piece. So there were a lot of different felt productions featured, and, and, and mine was also in it. And this is the process of felting. And this is um, hand embroidery on felt. And these are this was um, actually made by my supplier, who had scraps of felt left, and so he and his wife started to piece together and stitch these. And this is actually the most successful part of my line. People love these, and we we have samples, and people want them reproduced just the way they are. So these women are actually putting together the colors, and then the women are stitching, and the men are making the felt. And this is a different. This is not stitched together. This is the different colors layered in. Um, I also started a furniture and accessories line in India at the same time I started my carpet business. I started working on Pietra Dura in India because I knew it existed since I could see the Taj Mahal, which is all inlaid. 
So you can see that Pietro de Rabol, and now I have a metal clad furniture line and, um, and the reposé brass pots are actually made by an Indian designer that I'm representing. So um, you can see my carpets and a little over in the corner because we usually have it set up so people can see or we can demonstrate how the weaving takes place. It's another shot in my showroom. And this jolly table is also based on the architecture of the Taj Mahal, which I, I'm fascinated by that story. I'm probably reading my seventh book right now about the story of Shah Jahan and the whole family. That <laughs> it's such a family, it's whole, such a period of intrigue when the, when the um, during the Mughal period in the 17th century. I just love it. So I have a collection of these, um, they call it Jolly in India, the filigree work that are hand carved out of marble. And this is um, my supplier in India that um, has now passed away, but we started this collection together. And this is a, a chandelier that's made from the same, uh, the same marble as the Taj Mahal is made from. And these are the women who do the polishing with sort of soapstone. And they um, always keep their face covered when men are around or when somebody's taking a picture. And this is some of the carvers working on that. And this is the Pietra Dura. And this is the Reposé collection that I mentioned, some of the pieces. And then I also do a hand-carved wood furniture line that we clad with metals like copper, brass, and white bronze, and real silver. This is carved and then overlaid with the with metal. And this is um, pieces of amethyst and then the the legs are silver, and the top is um, marquetry. This is a carpet with some little um, sand cast brass tables in the foreground. And this is a bench, it's clad in copper. And then we have the very traditional Indian work. And I developed it into a surfaces collection so people can can really to cover what they want or make panels or um, screens. And this is a um, mirror, it's called Tikriya work and this was a, I, I have done some very big jobs with this for designers in New York um, for reproducing rooms that were all done with this mirror. And they were sort of like the original, you know, strobe lights. They were called candle rooms in the old days, and they were in the harems in, in India. And so the dancing women would, would dance, and the whole room is covered with this mirror, and then candles were lit, so it, it's like this swirling, and, and it was in the harem, so the, the queen or the princesses would be taking their baths and their spas and watching these dancing girls in these mirrored rooms. That's how it was traditionally used. If you're, if you're lucky and you're in India and you go to one of the forts where one of these rooms exists, they're always locked up now because they're so fragile. But if you know where they are, you can, you can bribe someone and you can get in. And um, I don't know how much you've read about the, the 17th century history in India, but in the harems there were always the eunuchs who associated with the harem. And they were the only men women and that were allowed into the harem to get all the secrets and they knew everything and so there's still this one um, candle room in Agra that I know of and that eunuch is still inside and you know as I said if you know about this you can bribe someone and they will you sneak in and he's in there and then he lights the candles and shows you how it, how it was in the old days it's really really fascinating and beautiful 
And this is a, what's called a Varadari in India, and we make these out of um, the, the hand hard marble. And this is one I had in my property in Miami and decorated. And this is a screen. This was my Miami showroom I used to have. And then I just quickly, I'm showing you some carpet collections just so you can get an idea of the style of my carpets. This is based on local jewelry. I don't usually do straightforward reproductions, they're always a little um, stylized. This is based on a Tibetan apron. This is a Japanese collection. This is the, my, my best job of all time in getting museum. I did the carpets and paintings gallery when, um, the, when it first moved to Bellevue, uh, Bel Air. And Richard Meyer was the um, architect. However, he didn't want carpets on the floor, but the curator did. So I did the carpets. And these are just some interior shots. This is a, a bank in Paris, hotel in New York, a home. And this is a felt piece. And I think that's my last slide. And if you're not, if, if I have, do we have three minutes? Okay, well I'll take questions and we're, I just want to show you a little cartoon that we we just made of um, which tells the story of Good Week. So it's just three minutes. But in the meantime, we can do questions. Yes? Uh, I'd love to hear something about your designers and where they get inspiration and what kind of catalyst you give them to help them get inspired. Um, most of the designs are mine, and I get inspired by a lot by old textiles. That's really what I started with. I loved Asian textiles, and I loved um, the old Tibetan carpet motifs. So I started doing mostly Tibetan carpet motifs or textile motifs, and then later I moved into textile designs, like chintzes and mobile designs, and, and tried to stay a little bit in Asia, but then as time went on, I started to get more into 17th century Italian designs and damasks and um, and then I became interested in Japanese textiles, the peasant coats and some of the um, old, the Shio collection is basically from the 13th century, the Ainu tribes and I started, um, I made a collection with the Museum of New Mexico and the Art Institute of Chicago and I also did something with the Met in New York. So I've done a number of collections using textile collections from museums that are then licensed. Um, so mostly it's, it's just, um, for me it's like by canvas, you know, if I could be a painter, I would probably be a painter, I would, would love to be a painter, but I'm design carpets, so <laughs> that's what I'm doing. And I just, I get inspired by, by many different things, nature, architecture, but my real, you know, initial, I think, inspiration was textiles.